Who hasn't heard of Justin Bieber? Who hasn't heard of Justin Bieber? Did you hear about his latest exploits? He and his father, Jeremy, allegedly refused the pilot's warning to stop smoking pot during a flight from Canada to New Jersey a week ago this past Friday. Marijuana smoke was so strong in the jet's cabin that flight crew members put on oxygen masks because they were concerned they might inhale so much it would cause them to test positive for drug use. The pilots repeatedly asked the pop star, his father, and other passengers to put away marijuana during the flight. The pilots said the singer and his father were verbally abusive to the flight crew. Surprise. This prompted the pilot to have the flight attendant stay close to the cockpit to avoid contact with Bieber as much as possible. And prior to this episode, Bieber got arrested for drag, uh, drag racing and DUI in Miami. This shortly after his house was raided by the police in connection with an egg-throwing allegation from one of his neighbors. Nowadays, it seems, the step toward fame and a financial fortune is to do something bad. Then get caught, next make national news, temporarily face dishonor, disgrace and infamy, give interviews, tell all, say you're sorry or not, grant more interviews, Wait five minutes, get contract offers from publishers, movie moguls, TV or radio stations, find yourself quickly restored to society, and lastly, make oodles of money. This pattern is the new scenario for success, I'm afraid, American style. Mark Cuban, owner of the Dallas Mavericks, that was the team that the Clippers were playing when I was at Staples when this whole thing happened. <laughs> Mark Cuban was once quoted as saying, from a business perspective, it's great. It's reality television. People love train wreck television. And you hate to admit it, but it is the truth. That's the reality today. End of quote. No more sackcloth or ashes. No more social banishment. No more shame-faced skulking about. Head, head hanging or, or head banging. No more losing everything. These days, redemption is cheap. And being disgraced isn't so bad. Shame is unfashionable. Shame is caused by the consciousness of our guilt, by the awareness of our impropriety, and this feels bad. Well, people don't want to feel bad about themselves anymore, at least not for very long, especially when there's money to be had. Shame has no status. It used to be that feeling bad about ourselves for, for having committed a crime or, or a sin held a poignant redemptive quality. Not anymore. Of course, shame didn't seem to have much status either back in Isaiah's day. We'll say a little bit more about that later. We are a people, it seems, who want to feel good about ourselves even after doing wrong. According to USA Today, what little suffering or shame there is these days is wickedly foreshortened. A person transgresses, he or she is caught, briefly chastised, 
and redeemed all in five minutes. The five minute redemption might work for a quick fix and it obviously might be profitable but it doesn't satisfy God. In the contemporary English version of our text this morning, Isaiah says, Do you think the Lord wants you to give up eating and to act as humble as a bent-over bush? Or to dress in sackcloth and sit in ashes? Is this really what he wants on a day of worship? I'll tell you what it really means to worship the Lord. Remove the chains of prisoners who are chained unjustly. Free those who are abused. Share your food with everyone who is hungry. Share your home with the poor and the homeless. Give clothes to those in need. I always find this interesting. Don't turn away your relatives. <laughs> the people of Isaiah's day had troubles. They were oppressing the workers. They were letting the hungry starve. They were letting the unclothed stay naked. They were uh, avoiding familiar responsibilities and, and generally supporting injustice through inaction all while going through the motions of faith, then wondering why there was no restoration. Sound familiar? For them, as for us, redemption had become a tool, a means to an end, like us, the Israelites just wanted to feel good about themselves without doing the real work. It's just like me saying in the aftermath of my January 15 health episode, just give me the meds and I'll get back on my unhealthy patterns of living. Give me my meds, but don't ask me to give up Panda Express, Vegas Seafood Buffet, Starbucks Fraps, European and, and Porto's pastries, Vietnamese pho noodles and, and split di rice dishes, BJ's, the Cheesecake Factory, etc., etc., etc. Our five minutes to redemption and success isn't so different from the Israelites version. It's just a quicker trip. Isaiah says, don't mistreat others or falsely accuse them or say something cruel. Give your food to the hungry and care for the homeless. Then your light will shine in the dark. Your darkest hour will be like the noonday sun. Get your spiritual house in order. Then you'll be well. What God wants is genu genuine repentance, genuine remorse, genuine reform then there would be genuine restoration. That's a principle you can embrace and bring home with you. Try to call to mind things or circumstances or relationships that you're in, that are in a broken state and have been for quite a while. And ask yourself, why has there not been any genuine restoration? Perhaps there has not been a genuine repentance, genuine remorse, or genuine reform. 
but a lot of hopeful thinking. If there is genuineness in all this, our hope is there will be genuine restoration. And it's what we need. We don't need any more brokenness in our lives. There is enough. So let's work on genuine restoration. It's what we need. It's what I need. Since my two ER visits and overnight hospitalization last month, I've switched to a low-sodium, low-fat diet and reintroduced regular walking to my daily routine, and I've lost at least 10 pounds. I've read Michael Pollan's Food Rules, an eater's manual, and am now reading his In Defense of Food, an eater's manifesto. I've embraced and am now practicing his mantra in answer to his basic question that began, that started him writing these books. He asked, what should I eat? And he discovered the answer to that in these three phrases. Eat food versus edible food-like substances. Eat food not too much, mostly plants. If you can remember that, that would, I think that would rise up to the level of genuine remorse, <laughs> leading the way to genuine restoration in your body. And I'm appealing for your support so that I can keep true to practicing this in my life. What God wants is genuine repentance, genuine remorse, genuine reform. Then there would be genuine restoration. It's simple. Redemption and restoration in the eyes of God don't come without culpability and penance. If I sound like uh, it's already Lent, I'm trying to point you to the fact that Ash Wednesday will be in about a couple of weeks. Culpability is saying, I did it. I'm sorry. I mean it. Penance or suffering means I feel your pain. Really. I am really sorry. I really mean it, mean it. It may be as simple as feeling shame or remorse or making right the wrong committed or paying an appropriate price. God told the Israelites what was needed. Remove the chains of prisoners who are chained unjustly. Free those who are abused. Share your food with everyone who is hungry. Share your home with the poor and homeless. Give clothes to those in need. Don't turn away your relatives. Work at reforming the social order that generates poverty, injustice, hunger, and want. These are acts of true repentance. These are acts of faith that arise only from a heart that has turned around to face God. Our witness as a congregation to these faith imperatives is, is a source of personal pride and joy. And if you aren't aware of what we're doing as a congregation, I invite you to check out these ministries or better still, get involved. Social service ministry, we offer it every Tuesday from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. And please see their request on page 9 of your bulletin. They've got something, they need something, and I hope you will, you will respond uh, to their need. It's on page 9 of your bulletin. We have our prayer quilt ministry. Last Sunday, we gave one to Marion 
Peña, and before that you sent me one. Thank you for that. It was really marvelous and, and healing to have that prayer quilt with me on my chest as I slept at night. Pastor Allison dropped it off uh, that first or second week of my leave. We have a union station feeding ministry. We've got two teams who could always use new people. You know, if you, you, we do this every two, two Sundays a month, and if the same people are doing it, you know, we, we need to give them a break so we could use additional people uh, to carry on this feeding ministry with our homeless at Union Station. We have friends indeed. And Pam Marks is, is the uh, uh, chair of, of the board of uh, directors. And it's doing marvelous ministry among the needy of our community. They need our support. And First Church is a part of the Ma Pasadena Mission area, a grouping of eight congregations uh, within the uh, greater Pasadena area. And, and next Sunday, we will be meeting here. Um, we are collaborating on the Bad Weather Shelter as well as a Family Promise uh, that uh, seeks to take homeless families off the streets. Uh, Holliston will be meeting, uh, will be hosting uh, some families in the summer. And we could use families to prepare dinner and, and, and breakfast. Our Michael Aron, our very own Michael Aron, heads learning works, engage in this special and challenging ministry of, of, of reforming and, and rehabilitating uh, youth in gangs, in broken families, castaways. Not a lot of uh, resources are are committed to this kind of ministry. And Michael is heading up such a splendid ministry named Learning Works. They could use our support. And we also offer here at First Church Recovery Support Group, led by Beth Gerber. They meet every Thursday from 8 to 10 p.m. And it's meant for those who, are, uh, who need support and are recovering from, from anything and everything. This is just a short list of of what we're doing as a congregation in response to these prophetic and biblical imperatives from the prophet Isaiah. The Lord Jesus in today's gospel lectionary reading and our anthem this morning reminds us that you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? You are the light of the world, the light of God exists in you. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and, and it gives light to all in the house. A colleague posted these thoughts on Facebook last Thursday. Your job is not to judge your job is not to figure out if someone deserves something. Your job is to lift the fallen, to restore the broken, and to heal the hurting. Turning around to face God, that is what repentance really is. Turn from darkness Turn to light. That's repentance. Do these things, says God, and there will be restoration. Do these things, says the prophet, and God will always guide you and provide good things to eat when you are in the desert. God will make you healthy. You will be like a garden that has plenty of water or like a stream that never runs dry. My friends, be salt and light to daily situations requiring the reintroduction of flavor and illumination. 
do these things and life will be good. Amen.